Today on Listen Up, a story worth dying for. The remarkable look back at missionaries who give it all. Welcome to Listen Up, I'm Lorna Duick. Why are there some stories so important that people will do anything to get them told? Today we look at beliefs worth dying for. An Afghan court has sparked international controversy as it decides if Abdul Rahman should be executed for converting to Christianity. The sentence, while legal under Afghan's Muslim Sharia law, would be a violation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Choosing which faith to follow can be a matter of life or death. Today we look at the case of Christian missionaries and their determination to bring the story of Christ even when they're not welcome. This is not a picnic. No one's ever made contact with these people and lived to talk about it. Mira Jada. His father dared to make the first contact. His aunt dared to make the second. Now it is his turn. Are we going to run? That young boy is Steve Saint, and he uh, is depicted as an actor there, but he joins us here in the studio. Steve. Thank you for being with Listen Up. This is the 50th year anniversary of a remarkable event that uh, was a story that gripped, gripped the world, 11 pages in Life magazine, Time magazine, you name it, headlines everywhere. Tell us why it was so important to your dad and his friends to go to a Stone Age tribe. Well, Lorna, the, the, there were a number of motivations, but the impetus to do it when they did it was that the Shell Oil Company had been moving into this tribe. Now, this tribe had never had friendly contact with the outside world at all. They were extremely violent within the tribe, but they also had frequent clashes with the outsiders, uh, Kichu Indians, Shrad, and with the oil company employees, and they had killed a bunch of oil company employees and it was getting it was getting so that people didn't want to work in that part of the jungles for fear that they would be speared too so the oil company went to the government and said if you want us to find oil you need to take care of this problem and my dad knew that uh, if if or when the government and uh, the oil company got to taking care of the problem that it would be the end of the tribe. The Ecuador government was actually going to clear the land, take back the land, was well, their I mean, intention. The, the, the Ecuadorians wanted the oil, and there's this little group of savage Indians, as they put it, uh, standing in the way of progress, and, uh, and they, couldn't, you know, they couldn't deal with them because nobody knew their language or their culture. So yeah, I mean, how do governments take care of problems like that? So my dad got in touch with four of his friends and said, you know, these people, these people will cease to exist unless somebody takes it upon themselves to make a friendly contact before the military goes in. Your dad had this ingenious way of taking his aircraft. He, he, it was such a tight landing area and he did this circular, well, actually you are the stunt pilot in the movie. You should tell me, what did you guys, how did your dad figure out how to get into this unreachable area? Well, like so many of us, he went to college and he was bored and he was sitting in an English class or something. He had a pencil on a long string and he was twirling the, the pencil, you know, making little circles, make the pencil go in a wide circle. And then he thought, that's too easy. Let me see if I can do the string in a big circle and make the pencil stand still. And he got it to work. And then he thought, you know, if I could do that with an airplane, while the airplane was flying in a circle, and let a long line out, I'll bet that something tied at the end would would hang motionless if you get the right length of line and the right speed and and so he tried it with the airplane and it worked and he used that to lower medicines to people on the ground where there was no airstrip and to retrieve things and then when they decided to try to make a friendly contact with this group of Indians he thought you know they couldn't go in over land because everybody that had been into their territory had been speared and so 
They said, hey, a gift is a universal way of saying I want to be your friend. So they started lowering gifts to this little clearing where some Waurani lived and the Waurani showed that they understood. Now they didn't know what that was flying around up there but they knew it was giving them gifts so they started putting in gifts of their own so they exchanged gifts for 13 weeks and then dad and his friends knew hey you know these are overtures of friendship we're giving to them but they're giving back to us so then they landed uh, dad found a little sandbar two river valleys over and landed there hoping that these people would find them You know, I knew that my dad had died, but I never really thought of the physical anguish. I saw Chad reenacting that. And then I just, you know, I could feel my throat constrict and, and thinking even more of the mental anguish, disappointment, disillusionment, certainly wondering, did we make a mistake? Did we misunderstand that this is what God wanted us to do? By the time I got back up from the ground, after my first time going through that, um, I looked up and Steve was there, and uh, he put his arms around me and uh, he said, thank you for doing this. Listen Up returns with more after this. I have to ask you, it is the Christian faith and the story of telling the Christian faith, the hope to convert people like the Wadani, that is the bottom line of what motivated your dad to give up his life? No. No. Okay, explain. There's nothing that we can do to convert people. That is, Minkai, who was here last time I was here, the man who killed my dad, he says all the time, what we do is when we find this good trail that God marked with his son's blood, he says, we walk this trail, but we shouldn't walk it alone. He said, we have to say to the people, oh, people, won't you please come walk this good trail with me? And he said, sometimes when I invite people, they're afraid. And so he says, I say to them, if you're afraid, you come and follow me, and me following God's son, Itota, will both come to his place. But you know what? It, it really is not something that we can do. I mean, who changes a heart like Minkai's? Um, so for those who would say, we shouldn't have the missionary movement imposing a faith view on people like Minkai. Yeah, you know, I hear this all the time. People telling, people even telling Minkai, you know, you people shouldn't have been subjected to this. And Minkai says to them, and the Waurani say to them, if these people had not come, we wouldn't be anymore. I mean, people say, oh, they really weren't violent. You know, what can I say to that? Come down there. I don't have one friend in the tribe whose father died of natural causes, not a single one. The oldest man in the tribe was in his very early 30s. Um, all my friends, my dad was speared to death, but my friends, I mean, there isn't, there isn't anybody in the tribe whose family members weren't speared to death. As a young man, you were fully expected to avenge your father's death. The Waduni tribe expected that. Yes. How did you personally come to the opinion that you could forgive and become friends with these people who killed your family? Well, now everybody wants to make me a hero of forgiveness, but you know, look at it from my perspective. My dad and his friends had guns. They could have defended themselves. They, I mean, a spear is a, is a lethal weapon, but I mean, I, I know how to spear, spear pigs, but a spear is a very short range weapon. And my dad and his friends had shotguns, they had pistols, my dad had a rifle. Um, when I met the Waurani, it wasn't, I wasn't thinking forgiveness. I just couldn't wait to meet these people. My dad was willing to die for them. My mom went on praying for them. And then my aunt, at the risk of her life, went in to live with them. So when I went out there and met them, I thought these have got to be the most 
important, special people on earth. Otherwise, why would my family have acted the way they did? So for me, forgiveness was just a natural thing. The real forgiveness in this story is that those men who killed my dad and, these, and my four uncles, they weren't really my uncles, but they knew in their culture, everything said, when this boy grows up, he is going to have the right and the responsibility of killing you to avenge your killing his father. And those same men, because they started walking this new trail, their choice, but once they started walking this new trail, they became different people. And so they took me and gave, taught me the skills that I needed to live in the jungles, the same skills that they had to have expected that I would use later on to come and avenge my dad's death by killing them. But they forgave me. I mean, we don't think of it in those terms, but they let go what they expected me to do and gave me the skills, taught me the skills that I could use to avenge my dad's death. I think that's the story of forgiveness. Listen Up returns with more after this. Listen Up is back talking with Professor Joanne Pepper of the Anthropology and Religious Studies Department at Trinity Western University. Joanne is also an expert on missiology, the study of why Christians feel the great need to tell their story even when they're not welcome. She joins us from Vancouver. So you have a faith group committed to the command of their God to go and tell. Bottom line, is it still applicable for the world today? Well, God's command to go and tell comes from uh, the Christian understanding of Jesus' command in Matthew 28, uh, one of the Gospels in the Bible. And there Jesus commissioned his followers before he went to heaven saying that uh, go and uh, disciple the nations or share my story, tell my story to all the peoples of the world. And this word nations is a word that is not uh, having anything to do with politics but everything to do with social divisions within society. And so you could look at a continent like Africa today where there's 55 different nations politically and you can say well there's a church that exists, a Christian church in almost all of those nations. But if you look at the way um, Jesus' description is, go and disciple the nations, meaning social groups or ethnic groups, there are about 3,000 different ethnic groups in Africa. And so not all of those people groups have had an adequate witness of Christ. And missionaries would contend that, that there's still lots of work to be done, opportunities to cross cultures. And it may be of interest too to know that uh, the majority of world missionaries that are out there today are coming increasingly from the two-thirds world that the largest number of uh, Christians on the planet today are not Western backgrounded people at all, not people from Europe or North America, but it's people from the Southern Hemisphere, from Latin America and from Africa. And uh, independent of anybody else's encouragement to them, these folks have gone forward knowing that just intuitively they want to share uh, about what faith has given them, about the uh, the goodness that has come into their lives through Christ, and so it's a, it's a worldwide movement. It, mission is totally relevant in the Christian community today. Professor Joanne Pepper of Trinity Western University, thank you very much. Thank you. The Noko gathered the whole village together and he began speaking to his whole village uh, in Embora. So I didn't understand what he was saying. My translator didn't understand what he was saying. There was a moment when I wasn't even paying attention that the whole village just broke out into applause. He then turned to me and said, um, we believe the story is a, is, is a story that the world should know. Well, the whole community became happy and ready and willing, and they accepted that they'd cooperate on this work. Look, I felt doubt sometimes that Mark, is he telling the truth or is he telling me this in a dream? Because I never imagined that I'd be on a movie like this. I'm an Indian. I'm not capable of reaching anything this high. 
the voices of a few of the indigenous actors in End of the Spear. And Steve Saint, what's so fascinating is this movie is told from the perspective of the tribal people. Mm -hmm. Give us a snapshot on how that Stone Age tribe has reacted since your dad and his friends introduced um, Jesus Christ into that culture. Well, my dad and his friends didn't. They acted it out by going, but you know, they, they had one friendly contact and then two days later they were speared. So what their, what their interaction with the Waodani did was to, was to leave this huge question in the Waodani mind. Why would these people who had guns not kill us and let us kill them? Why would they do that? That just didn't make any sense. So two years later, when my aunt and one of the widows were invited to go back in by two women who fled from killings in the tribe, that was, that was really the thing that opened the door because these warriors thought we've got to know why they did this. What is the social status of these people? Has life improved for them? Well, yes, in, in one hugely significant way that uh, almost all the killings stopped. Now, there's still, there's still some killing, but uh, you know, they had over a 60% homicide rate. I mean, imagine that. He, the U.S. is considered a very violent country around the, around the world, but I mean, we have one homicide per thousand, or one homicide per 2,000, something like that. The Waodani had one homicide, more than one homicide for every two people in the tribe killed by other people in the tribe. I mean, just a violence that people don't understand. But they didn't have any way to stop the violence. It wasn't that they liked it. I mean, if your neighbor is, if you're free to kill your neighbor, your neighbor's free to kill you. Um, but what, what happened was when Aunt Rachel went in and Dayuma said, tell them about Wangungi. And uh, so Aunt Rachel would tell Dayuma, Dayuma would, would tell the people. When they realized that the Creator had actually communicated saying people should not kill other people, then it finally gave them the reason to, okay, Wangungi is the creator. They already knew that Wangungi was the creator. What they didn't know is that Wangungi didn't see it well that people should kill other people, and boom, so that people said, okay, I'm not going to kill anymore. Somebody else said, I'm not going to kill, and so the killing quit. That didn't mean that everybody started going to church and became Christians. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means that they finally had a reason. The gospel gave them a reason to quit the killing. You, you insisted that filmmakers first go ask them for permission, whether they could shoot and tell their story. Uh, let's give the closing word to Minkaya. The motivation to say yes was they wanted to help North America. Well, first they said no. They said no. Foreigners keep wanting to come and they want to say what they think about us, but they don't say what we say about ourselves. So they said, what do you say? And I said, if you say no, then I say no. And they said, why do they keep wanting to do this? And I said, well, I've talked to these men and they say, and then I told them what had happened at Columbine, because that's what really moved Mark Green, the, the executive producer, to want to make this story into a movie. And when I told them that, they said, Basically, they said, you've got to be kidding me. These people that are so smart that they can make airplanes fly, they can talk into little boxes with no strings attached, and people can hear them on the other side of the world. People that are that smart, they still live like we used to live, angry and furious and killing Onunki for no reason. I said, yep, it happened. I mean, look at the newspaper. And then Minkai said, then I say yes. You tell them that that's how we used to live, but then you be sure to show them how we live now. Those of us who walk God's trail, Wengungi's Taro, we now live happily and in peace. Right. And then he said, maybe the foreigners can learn to live well too. Well, Steve, thank you for putting such an amazing story behind our question, are there some things worth dying for? Um, I think people can decide for themselves uh, what they've seen happen in your life. Uh, I, I first read this when you autographed an old book. This is the original that uh, Elizabeth Elliot, one of the widows, wrote. This is the first edition of a book that went into thousands and millions of copies. And now you have written uh, your 
whole 50-year overview of this amazing story, End of the Spear. Uh, even just read it for the sheer anthropology in it. It's amazing. And we're going to give the last word today to the man who killed your father, Minkai, and his underlying reason for why he wants his story to be public. Here from the Wadani tribe is Minkai. The foreigners are living angry and violent like we once did, but they could be living well. Do you understand what I'm saying? We also used to live doing badly, and then many of us, agreeing, we changed. And now the foreigners can too, us telling them. Closed captioning provided by Duca Financial Services Credit Union. Discover more affordable banking at duca.com. Well, our next guest's family has given it all to missions. Erin Chapman joins us from Langley, British Columbia. Tell us a little bit about your time on the mission field with your family. Um, I spent about 11 years in Cameroon, West Africa. My parents were with Wycliffe Bible Translators, so my mom started off as a primary school teacher in Cameroon, and my dad was uh, an aviation pilot there. They kind of moved into more of administrative roles later on, um, but it was a great experience. Uh, went to really small schools, um, so yeah, I, I really enjoyed my experience there. Tell us about what happened when you returned from Africa. Yeah. Um, Right when I was finishing third grade, uh, my family needed to come back to Canada for a furlough. And um, on the way, we decided to stop in Nairobi, Kenya, and um, just do some traveling there. My mom had spent some years there earlier. And uh, so we had a great family time. We went on safari, and we just really enjoyed our time there. And on the way back, um, when we arrived in Canada, my brothers both fell really ill. and. We went to the doctor and the doctor said that he thought they may have um, strep throat or something. So started treating that and um, no, nothing was happening. They weren't getting any better or anything. So um, ended up, they were taken to emergency and um, probably within like eight hours of them being taken to emergency, they ended up both passing away of malaria. Um, after my brothers died, we spent two years in Canada. And then we went back to Cameroon, and um, my dad was still flying at that point, um, flying the missionaries to villages and back to the main city and that sort of thing. And um, he moved into more of an administrative role. And um, as a result of that, he was asked to move to um, Nairobi, Kenya, to, become, to work with the Africa Area Office there. And um, they spent some time back in Canada before they went, because I was just starting university. In January of 2000, they were going to some conferences, some Africa area conferences. And as the plane took off, they, um, there was some mechanical difficulties. We don't know exactly what happened, um, but some alarms did go off. And so the pilot was trying to land the plane. They did crash and both of my parents ended up um, dying very much instantly. Erin, what effect did that have on you? How did you handle that news? Um, I think I went through a lot of different emotions, um, a little bit of anger, but more just kind of uh, numbness, because how can you really, how I, you can't really decipher exactly what you're feeling at that time. Um, very scary and um, just a little bit alone, but at the same time I had so many of like the girls in my dorm that were there supporting me, and then I went immediately back to Hamilton, Ontario, and there was um, a ton of family and friends there and a whole bunch of friends from Cameroon who are now living in the States and Canada came up to to see me so um, I felt really supported at the time and uh, so that was that was really great. And what are your thoughts on families who are missionaries? I don't think that just because you're a missionary you're at more risk than anybody here um, you're human so you're susceptible to accidents to illness no matter what and never have I thought that just because my parents were missionaries is why my brothers died or why they died I mean it's it's part of God's plan I don't think it's just because that they they were missionaries they were doing what God wanted and um, you know we just have to trust that everything happens for a reason 
Erin spent most of her life on the mission field, so uh, being Canadianized has not been the easiest task for her, but she was in her second year at Trinity Western, adapting, adjusting well. Of course, the night that the uh, word was received about the accident and uh, possible deaths of her parents was just traumatic for her. It was uh, very, very difficult, but uh, God provided counselors and uh, strength, and she's coping very well now. Well, they could call this a bestseller, but it's free. It's Our Daily Bread, one of North America's most popular spiritual resources for the questions that affect your lives. Available for you at keypromises.org, no cost or obligation. Order your copy today. We interviewed families today who have buried their parents, their children, for the Christian story. Either Christianity is the greatest lie that deceives people, or it really is a story worth dying for. What a risky question to investigate. I'm Lorna Dulick.